Five years ago, we set out on a journey. Today, our journey continues to help students develop critical financial skills and includes equipping students with tech skills for the jobs of today and tomorrow. This is our opportunity to close the education, skills, and opportunity gap in our communities by empowering educators and inspiring students to help today's youth become tomorrow's tech-driven workforce and business leaders to access their potential. Okay, how's everybody doing today? Yeah, this is a real great start to this uh, conference and festival. And I tell you, if you're a student, you are lucky to be here. So, all you students, raise your hands. Oh, I wish I were in your seat. There's so much to see, so much to do. I hope you make the most of it and enjoy it a lot. Now, how many of you are parents or teachers? Raise your hands. Yeah, that's right. Okay, if you're a student and you see someone raising their hands, or a grandparent, grandma, um, I want you to give that parent or a teacher a pat on the back because they made it happen so you could be here. You owe them a lot and a thank you for bringing you here to this amazing festival. That's the least we can do. Thank you so much. So I'm in the Air Force and I'm a scientist and that's what I was asked to talk to you today about and what it's like being a scientist in the Air Force. I've been in the Air Force for about 27 years and I've been a scientist my whole career. I have loved every single minute of it and by the way, it gets better and better and better and doing things like being here today with all of you and talking about being a scientist in the Air Force is really the cherry on top. So what I thought I'd do is first tell you a little about my background a little about what I have done in the Air Force, what I do in the Air Force, and why, um, how you might be able to do that as well, or how you could help us out. All right, the first test, there we go. Okay, so there have been a lot of interesting uh, briefs today. For example, the science behind the stuntman, right? How many of you were able to see that? Pretty interesting. So do you know who this stuntman is? Did he talk about this particularly famous one? So this is a famous stuntman from the 1970s and he used to take that motorcycle, jump a bunch of cars and in 1976 was the bicentennial of the United States and he wanted to do a particularly sensational jump and he did it right near my hometown. He jumped over a canyon and I'm from a very small town. I lived on Main Street. It's in the state of Idaho and this canyon is called the Snake River Canyon. Well the stuntman is named Evil Knievel and he's, he's very famous to parents and grandparents but I'm from the side of the canyon where he did not land. So he was unfortunately not successful. He was, he did, he's okay, don't worry. But uh, I'm from a really small town in Idaho that's known for Evil Knievel's supposed to be landing spot. So how did I get to here? Well, I had an aunt who was a school teacher and she visited the, Na the Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. And she came back to visit me one time and she said, if I had my life to do over again, I would go to one of the service academies, the military academies. And she wanted to go to the Naval Academy, but of course she was uh, already well set in her career path. But it inspired me to look and explore and find out, well, what could a service academy do for me? And so I was fortunate to go to the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, and that's pictured at the lower left. It's a beautiful location, that's uh, a chapel which has, is a very amazing architectural uh, building there and I got a Bachelor of Science and I, that's where I really got exposed to science and technology and engineering. I took a variety of classes from chemistry and physics to mechanical engineering. But what really was interesting to me was the 
marriage between the technical side of science and engineering with the human side, behavioral science. And how many of you know the person pictured on the right? She's in the Big Bang Theory. Do you know her name? Go ahead. Amy, Amy Farrah Fowler, right? And so she does a different kind of a uh, behavioral science and she studies monkeys, of course, and um, that was an area that was of most interest to me and particularly for the Air Force. So how do humans interact with machines? So I became versed in things like psychology as well as industrial engineering, electrical engineering and engineering mechanics so that we could design better machines to be more user friendly, to better support uh, pilots to make more, uh, more compatible displays and things like that. So the Air Force sent me to University of Illinois in Urbana, Illinois, and I got my PhD in psychology with a minor in cognitive psychology, learning, decision making, thinking and communicating, as well as industrial engineering. And so I was able to marry those two domains and look at how can we design displays so that pilots or anyone interacting with a machine can more quickly detect changes and I've used that throughout my Air Force career. And I'll say, I didn't grow up in an Air Force family. My mom and dad still live on Main Street in Jerome, Idaho, but I'm the oldest of three kiddos, and we're not kids anymore, of course, but I have a younger brother and a younger sister. Now that picture is from the early 90s. You can tell my hairstyles changed just a little bit. I'm on the left. And my brother joined the Air Force, went to the Air Force Academy, and he is a remotely piloted aircraft pilot, and my sister became a nurse. So we are now an Air Force family and have been ever since. So I wanted you to know a little about me and how I use science in the Air Force. So one of the things that I really think is true about me is I just love a challenge. And whether it's a mental challenge or a physical challenge, I say bring it on, the harder the better, and I'll find a way to, to solve it, to solve the problems of the day. And uh, what you see there is if you have four pencils and I have seven, seven apples, how many, how many pancakes will fit on the roof? I'm still trying to figure out that one. And if you figure it out, I hope you'll tell me by the end of the day. But that's a good example of a mental challenge or some kind of challenge that really is exciting to me and something I love to tackle. On the right, you see a picture of me running, and that's uh, my seven-year-old son. And of course, he's beating me. And we're, the good news is we're ahead of two soldiers who have 50-pound rucks on their back. So you know, the good news is we can run faster than somebody carrying a very, very heavy load. But uh, my son definitely beat, it, beat me, and I was working hard to catch up. And, and one thing about the Air Force is there is no shortage of challenges to tackle, whether it's mental or physical. So, Challenges in the Air Force come in all shapes and sizes, and I have used the scientific method throughout my career to get after them and to solve them and find new ways of getting the job done. So one of the challenges I was able to do was the design of a radar interface that was on the back of an aircraft called the Joint Stars and it was an interactive um, picture and my job was to find the best, most useful display for those individuals looking at the radars, the radar picture, so they could better understand what was going on. Another example of a challenge that I got to do as a scientist in the Air Force was the design of simulators. So one thing the Air Force does is it trains a lot of pilots and it's always looking for the next generation of pilots. It can be really expensive to have those aircraft 
flying in the air, it can be very noisy, and it can be very crowded in the air, and there's not a lot of space up there to practice some of the maneuvers that they need to do. So we build simulators and we look to challenge those pilots in new and different ways to increase their learning, to increase their decision making, and make them better pilots in ways that they really can't do in the air. So the simulators and understanding the interaction of the psychology with the simulator gets the best bang for your buck. Another example of a challenge that I was able to get after in the Air Force was designing a multinational exercise in virtual space. What was that? It's kind of like uh, the precursor to the video games of today where you have a virtual world and you have people sitting in different countries interacting in the same virtual space. And that's something that's a little more common now but when I was doing it in the Air Force, and we're connecting Air Forces from different countries around the world, from France to Australia to Canada, and we're having these aircraft dogfight in the air and practice their skills and taking that back so we can do better in the future, it was really a fun and exciting area to be. So that brings me to what I'm doing today I'm located in San Antonio, and as you heard in the job description, I'm part of an air base wing. Well, San Antonio is the largest joint base in the DOD. It's not quite as big as the DC metro area, but it's just about second, and we have a lot of really exciting challenges going on there, a lot of exciting missions going on there, and here are just a sample of a few of them. For example, um, what you see there is worldwide cyber and intelligence. So there are units in San Antonio that are on the cutting edge of cyber technology, cyberspace, protecting our systems so that we can continue to communicate between our militaries around the world 24-7, 365 days a year. We have soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, and coast guardsmen who are all doing those missions. We have a lot of flying training going on in San Antonio. 100% of the military working dogs are also trained in San Antonio, whether it's Air Force, Navy, Army, as well as the TSA. So if you ever go through uh, the airport and your bags are being sniffed by one of the TSA dogs, they came from San Antonio. DOD's only level one trauma center, so Wilford Hall as well as Brooks Army Medical Center is the cutting edge of medical technology and it's in San Antonio. And so my team has the distinct advantage of supporting all the mission partners, all the missions that occur in San Antonio. When you add it all up, it's about 80,000 military personnel who live, work, and play in that region and a lot of exciting missions going on. So no matter what the mission is, innovation, cutting through the problems, persevering through the challenges, those are the keys to success. You know, the first military aviation flight in the world occurred in San Antonio. It was just a biplane. His name was Lieutenant Benjamin Fuloy. He learned via letter correspondence with the Wright brothers and he had an aeroplane number one that was taking off on a sled and was doing the first military application of, of an aircraft. But there are all kinds of things that are going on in the Air Force today. From the simulators on the left, as you see, these continue to be built to help the pilots learn their skills, test their skills, challenge them in ways that they won't get in the real world, to communicating and collaborating, whether it's across different military services, between the military and our civic partners, or around the world, as I mentioned earlier. 
as well as designing state-of-the-art, cutting-edge technologies and infrastructure to support the military that we have. So why it all matters is because we can't, we can't take a back seat to helping our military be the best in the world. We, have, uh, we, we care about bringing all our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines home, ensuring they have the best quality care, and so we're giving them the best transport that we can. But we also want to make sure that no matter what the challenge is, that your military is going to win. And so we're continuing to push the envelope, look for state-of-the-art technology, state-of-the-art ideas to make us bigger and better and faster. And so that's why I'm excited to be here today, because all of you in this audience have an opportunity. You can make us better. You have the bright ideas, the ways to know what will make us a better military. These are a few of the folks that I have met over the course of my time just in San Antonio, and I wanted to tell you just about a few of them here. Amber is in the bottom right corner. She is 13 years old, and she wants to be an astronaut. We've been chatting back and forth for a couple years now, and she's very excited about joining the Air Force and she has her sights set on becoming a future astronaut and maybe being one of the first to go to Mars. And you know that's an area that we're looking at going. Really exciting. On the bottom left, Captain Christy Wise. She is a 130 pilot doing incredible things. That's a pretty big airplane, pretty tough one to fly. And I don't know if you can tell in the picture, but she has and her leg was amputated above the knee. And yet, even today, she was able to work through those challenges to earn her wings so that she can fly as an airman in this aircraft. She worked through an amazing amount of challenges and she continues to break some barriers. On the top right, there are some defender security forces who protect all our military installations. They live in San Antonio. And then on the top left, some really, it's just about being a family, but we owe a lot to those who came before us, some of the veterans. Sitting in the chair is Dorothy Lucas. Can you see her sitting in that top left picture? She is, her, Dorothy was one of the first female pilots ever during World War II. You might remember, or you might have learned that during World War II, they had a lot of losses of pilots overseas when they were fighting in Europe or in Asia. And so what they started doing was they started training women for the first time ever to ferry the aircraft that were being built from the production centers to the coastlines, and then from there, someone would take them over to the front. Well. In this program, about 6,000 women applied to be women air service pilots. Dorothy Lucas was one of them. They only accepted about 1,600 to go through the flying training program. Only 1,100 actually made it through and became pilots to do this kind of a ferrying service from, from the production line just about to the front. And so she really paved a way for future military pilots in the Air Force. And uh, she's out in San Antonio going to an air show. On the left is Brigadier General Jeannie Levitt, and she's one of the first combat fighter pilots in the Air Force. And those two got to meet, and what a neat connection that they have that they've never met before, but they did it in San Antonio. So. I hope that gives you an idea about the breadth of things that a scientist could do in the Air Force. I've been really fortunate each and every day to do the things that I've been able to do to push the technology, to push the Air Force in new and better ways. And I can't wait to see what you can do to make us even better. Thank <laughs> you.